Smart Alex Show, baby! Well, anyways, bro, we'll get, we'll get it started off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to the Smart Alex Show podcast. Today, we got another very special guest, a good friend of mine, Mayor Estenville. My oh boy my was born in Haiti, moved to the Big Apple out there in New York on the East Coast, been there, you know, for his whole life. My boy has interned with the Goldman Sachs, one of the best, most powerful banks globally. He's worked as a summer analyst there the past two summers, worked at Prudential before, working on a lot of other amazing things. Welcome, Mayor. What's up, my guy? My guy, I appreciate you for having me. I'm um, just excited to, like, honestly, like, reconnect, kind of catch up and speak. Yeah, um, no, no, that's what I was hype about, bro. When I reached out, it was like, I just wanted to catch up and see what you were up to, bro. And, you know, just like have a genuine conversation, my guy. So I'm looking yes, forward sir. to it, bro. Appreciate you doing this. But uh, yeah, man. So so, what, how's New York City been the past year, bro? Like, it's, it's, been it's been cool, but it hasn't been New York, you know. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I think that that's everywhere globally with the pandemic. Sure. But I feel like New York has felt it so much more just due to the fact that like being from here, Normally, it doesn't matter what time it is, what day it is, there's something going on. Yeah. And, like, I was literally in the city the other day, and, like, I've never seen so little people just in New York. And I was just like, yeah. sheesh, it's actually a bit crazy. But I, I think everybody's kind of, like, coping, recovering. And we'll be lit again. We'll be lit. Soon come. <laughs> <laughs> soon enough. Soon enough. That's wild, bro. So how far out from, like, the city city do you live of, of New York? Yeah, so I kind of get, me personally, I kind of get the best of both worlds because okay. my family lives out in Long Island, which is more like the suburban part. Um, so like in terms of that, like when I was going, it takes me about like a 40 minute train ride to get there. But at the same time, um, as you know, like I, go, I go to Baruch College, which is located like literally right in the middle of Manhattan, oh. like 10 minutes from Penn Station. So in that aspect, I kind of always got like the best of both worlds. So like if I need to get late, I'll head into the city. If I prefer yeah. like the quietness, I'm yeah. chilling at home. That's a sub, bro, that you give the best of both worlds, a little bit of, like, that suburban vibe, and then if you want to, you're right there by the inner city. That's what's up, bro. Sure. So you got Baruch, Columbia, NYU. Y'all got a bunch of universities right up in there, bro. So I, yeah, I literally. It's, it's a good time being a college student in, in New York. <laughs> Honestly, because so many of, like, their events, they kind of just combine together. Yeah, so, I bet, yeah. That's what's up. That's interesting to me because, like, Austin, there's a couple of universities there, but it's mostly, like, UT is the big one. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I think of, like, you know, I don't know if you remember uh, Claude from, from Boston University, but he's telling me how, like, you know, like, there's all the universities up there. Like, you've got Harvard. you got all, all the other ones. You know, I'm like, man, that seems wild, bro. This seems like a fun yeah. <laughs> So many colleges, like, in the same vicinity with each other. It's, that's wild, bro. But, nah, man, I'm, I'm glad you, you and your fam have been safe, you know, during these wild times. I know it hit, you know, NYC first, man. What, what was it like? Like, how, how scary was it just being there and, like, knowing like shit this is kind of like the epicenter of, of where it's all going down right now now yeah i think initially it was pretty crazy because yeah. obviously nobody knew anything but even for me like nyc was going crazy outside of me everyone in my family is in healthcare, so doctors nurses uh -huh. etc so like it was just like yo like hours on hours like i go like certain nights i would even see my mom like that Damn. and she would always be worried that like oh she might catch it and bring it back home Heck yeah. so at first it was like honestly so crazy but thank god like everyone's actually just like been super safe um and it's all just worked out so far so that's good man i'm I'm glad to hear bro yeah i have some family members that are also like uh, one of my family members is a nurse and she works mm -hmm. at like one of the major public hospitals here in dallas and like they got hit pretty hard so she was always worried about that too you know that she would bring yeah. it back over here but now nah, respect to your fam bro you know like they've been clutch out there on the front lines during this whole pandemic. So, so what's up with that, bro? Why, why are you the oddball? Why were you the one that wanted to go to <laughs> finance instead of, you know, going the medical route like your fam? It's, it's crazy because I think up to like going into high school, I always said I would do like, you know, something similar. Like I was in like this science program where we would do research over the summer, took all like the AP bio chemistry courses. Um, but ultimately like my senior year, I was super focused on like, I was like, hey, like, I wanted to learn finance because one thing, even though my family's all like in healthcare, yeah. I always felt like we didn't have a good understanding of like financial literacy, especially coming from Haiti, which is always known as like, you know, like poorest country in the like Western hemisphere, et cetera. And I kind of wanted to be the one that kind of like learned about how money works, operates, spread that knowledge to my family, spread it to other people. 
and kind of like revitalize the economy back there too. That's kind of like in the long-term plans, kind of, you know, like establish certain businesses it, and spur that growth. So I was like, all right, we're going we're gonna to step away from the, from the, the medicine real quick and, and head over to the business side. That's dope, bro. That, Cause I was actually wanted to dive into that, you know, like the bigger purpose behind why you do what you do. And the mm. fact that you've got that long-term vision, you know, for financial literacy. And it's like, you're going back to your roots, bro. Like, like where you're actually from and that long-term vision and that purpose. And like, I want to bring financial literacy, not only to my family, but like to my people, you know, back in Haiti. So mad respect to you, bro. That's, that's awesome. So what, what's the journey been like, bro? Like once you kind of pivoted, you said you were in high school, right? When you pivoted from like medical to finance, what's that yeah. journey been like, bro? Like, you know, in your young career working for Goldman, Prudential, like, like what's it been like studying it? Honestly, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a crazy ride. I think it hasn't gone anything like I thought it would be both like positive and negatives, but it's, it's been good. Right. I think so coming out of high school again, didn't have much of a business understanding. So I did some research and found out that Baruch college was really good in terms of like a business school, especially being like in the heart of the city. Cause you have all these companies here. You could easily kind of like connect with, network with um from there my freshman year i got hella active bro yeah. first got in touch with like naba i've been in the government pretty much my whole college career i'm a senator right now on campus Word. so like i think just from like these different things i always kind of like kept in touch met recruiters kept in touch with them did like you know the case competition with prudential like you mentioned yeah. and then from there honestly kind of stumbled onto goldman by accident i'm not even gonna lie like oh. i'm not gonna act like i was the most impressive student or anything like that Okay. It was honestly all through like a networking event. So I had applied to the scholarship through NABO, which is the National Association of Black Accountants. Um, and literally before this, I was applying to Goldman and they were dubbing me. Like I had no shot, bro. Okay. And then applied to that scholarship. Goldman was one of their partners. So with the partners at the scholarship dinner, you get to meet some of the people from the company. So I, I pulled up, they were like, oh, by the way, Goldman Sachs is the company that sponsored your scholarship. And I'm like, cool, cool, cool. So throughout the dinner, you know, like I'm just speaking to different people there. And I really hit it off with this one dude because he was just like super cool. Yeah. And I had no idea who their titles were. I thought everybody was just like some basic person. Okay. Just and entry then, level roles, you thought? Yeah, kind of, right? Nothing crazy. Come to find out, he was actually a chief executive at the firm. So like I'm talking like with David Solomon and all of them, like he's the guy like they're making decisions. Damn. So I had followed up with him, still not even knowing his role, just to say like, yo, like you were super cool. Like it was a pleasure to meet you. Uh -huh. And from there, he, he forwarded my email to a couple of his MDs and VPs that he knew were through NABA. And he was like, hey, like I want to meet, I want this kid to at least get like an interview with us. I wanted him introduced to some of the people. And that's honestly kind of like how I stumbled onto it. Did the interviews, knocked them out. And then, did the internships, but so, so unexpected. So, so to, to take a step back, so like what goes into, you know, when you're at a dinner and you're networking with all these people, you know, at Goldman, for example, and then what, what goes into following up with them? For those out there that, you know, like they, they might hit it off in a conversation with, with a partner or someone at a company, and then they're kind of like unsure of how to follow up, how to approach it. How'd you approach it, man? Yeah, I think, I think my advice to people is, even if you're unsure of how to follow up, just follow up anyways. That's always the start. Just always make sure you follow up. And I think secondly, like you mentioned, started, yeah. if you, like you mentioned, like if you hit it off, that's, that's already a great connection. It's so good to have like a natural connection as opposed to something that's more forced. So if you were able to make like a very natural connection with somebody, just follow up with them on that. I think one of the MDs I have met at the firm too, like he had mentioned he was a Celtics fan. And I think a couple of days later, they got smoked by the Lakers, which are my team. <laughs> so I kind of just sent him like a little email to follow up and kind of like brag a little. But it's those little things that kind of like keep that connection going. Um, additionally, like even if you haven't necessarily hit it off with someone, I think you just follow up and kind of inquire about what they do. Because yeah. at these banks, the titles sound very like, oh, I'm working in this. But when you dive into what they do, everybody's doing something so specific. Um, there's always so much you can learn from it. So for a lot of professionals, even just asking for like 15 minutes to kind of like, you know, get a better understanding of what you do, et cetera, I always find like it's a good way to follow up. Yeah, no doubt, bro. There's a lot of good points there to dive into. Um, something I love that you said is like just finding something in common, some, something like a commonality, like you said, for, for basketball with you and that guy. 
It's like he's yeah. a Celtics fan, you're a Lakers fan. There's something similar for me is like my supervisor at ESPN when I first interviewed with him. This wasn't a commonality. Well, I guess, you know, both being fans of football, but he was a Giants fan, right? Two, <laughs> two New York City boy. He's like, I'm a Giants fan. You know, I'm from Dallas. I'm a Cowboys fan. We're both in the NFC lease. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, yeah, just kind of teasing there, like, hey, you know, my boys are going to whoop up on the Giants and, you know, this and that. Just stuff like that goes a long way, you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, we're all people and, you know, mm-hmm. there's only so much you can talk about work. And if they see that you're actually a real person as well, someone relatable, someone they'd actually like to have a conversation with or talk to, that'll go a long way too, bro. Definitely. So, yeah, that's that's a lot of good points, man. So, Lakers are your team, bro. Good time to be a Lakers fan, man. How right about now, you Lakers fan? Not 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 the last couple of years though, but it, it's okay. finally it's finally, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's it's finally paying over. So have you been a Lakers fan like growing up since the Kobe days early on or what? Yeah, so like pretty much since I was in Haiti. And I, I it's probably a test to that too. I think so. Being in Haiti, obviously, you don't get all of the teams, right? Yeah. Um you kind of get the popular teams. When you're in like a different country, you're always gonna kinda learn more about the popular team. So back in the day, um Growing up, I was four or five. You know, we had like the, the Shaq and Kobe years. Yeah. So those are always the games that would be streamed in Haiti. So that that's who I saw growing up, and I was like, "Yo, this team is crazy." So literally from birth, I kind of just stuck to that. So um, early two thousand Shaq and Kobe. That's that's the first games you started watching. Yes, sir. Damn, yeah, that'll make you a, that'll make you a Lakers fan for life, bro. Because I was just <laughs> that's a different level of dominance, bro. Damn near getting a four P. Like that's. That's crazy. So I'm not a Lakers fan, bro. I'm a, I'm a LeBron fan. I'm a big LeBron. Okay, fan. I respect it. I respect it. Um, so I've been rooting for the Lakers, but actually I've been reading this book, bro. It's uh, it's called LeBron Inc. It's crazy, bro. You'd like it, you know, being another business mind. The ventures mm-hmm. that dude has going on, on the side and like around basketball, how he's monetized his like brand and image is insane, bro. Like yeah, I know. his dude behind the scenes that handles all his deals. I forget his name, but he. Oh, Mav. I think so. No, 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 not Mav Carter. Mav Carter handles a lot of it, bro, but there's another dude behind the scenes that's – Mav Carter is more of, like, the partnership, sponsorships, more the marketing dude, and Rich Paul's like, more player management. There's okay. another dude even more behind the scenes, like, just straight business, bro. This dude is a CPA. He was, like, a tax attorney. He worked <laughs> investment banking, like, just a sparkling resume, bro. Yeah. And he, you know, he used to manage Arnold Schwarzenegger's money. Okay. And so some things he would do is like he bought a 737 Boeing jet from Singapore, leased it back to them. They got into real estate and he's like, all right, all these things have risk. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? But you know what doesn't have risk? Monetizing a celebrity, monetizing the brand. LeBron endorses this. Schwarzenegger endorses this. It's just like printing money. So yep. they went that route, bro. And it's, it's obviously worked out really well for them, bro. But it's, it's an interesting read, bro. I recommend it, but yeah, dude. Now I'm, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a Lakers fan because of Bron. I want to see him win another ring. I think they got even better this year with Gasol. I mean, that dude is just a genius on the basketball court. A lot of the other pieces yeah. they added. I think they got better. It's crazy to think, and I think they look like they have a good chance at a repeat, bro. They do, but today's news: Harden to the Nets. I was like, ooh. What do you think, do you think about that, bro? You think they got better? The, the Nets? I don't know. Yeah, because I don't. Definitely. Oh my yeah, gosh! You have so? Kyrie, KD, and Harden. Jesus Christ! It almost that's, seems that's like too game. much firepower, though. But like three ball dominant dudes, like who? who that definitely is true. Not only that, yeah, like, it'd be one thing if they were just like ball dominant scorers, but it's like the personalities in play too. Like, I don't I know. I think that's bro. the biggest hurdle, though. Like, that's if the they can hurdle. overcome that, I think they have like an easy path to like at least like Eastern Finals. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, bro. Like, maybe it doesn't work every game, you know, throughout the regular season. But in the playoffs, it's like seven-game series. Like, you got those three dudes on the court, <laughs> bro. It's like, on defense, dudes would just be scared. Like, bro, any one of them could just Legit. go off. Like, how do you stop that in a seven-game series? You got a good point, bro. I don't know. I think if it was Nets-Lakers in the final, that'd be a, be a wild matchup. That'd be a matchup for the ages on the real. That'd be a great matchup. You got <laughs> L.A. versus New York. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Oh, yeah, bro. Got another great business mind over there with Jay-Z and the Nets, bro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, that's that's what's up, though. So, so you're a big basketball fan. It, it, you a fan of anything else? Any other sports? I'm, I'm honestly largely pretty much basketball. Um, grew up a soccer fan. But as I moved over to the United States, I kind of, like, started watching less and less and less. I got you. Um, and ironically enough, I played football back in high school but never actually really watched it. 
enough to like be a fan of any team. I'll just catch whatever like game might be I going you. on. So you're not really a Giants fan, a Jets fan, none of that. <laughs> it's never a good time to be a, a New York football fan. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough being a New York football fan. Shit, it's tough being a Dallas football fan. But I mean, at least Eli got y'all them rings, you know. Um, yeah, bro, it's kind of opposite for me. So I uh, I grew up playing soccer, bro. That's that's my okay. sport. I grew up playing soccer. I, I played keeper despite being like five seven on stilts. Yeah. You know what I mean? I had the hops for it and the agility, but um, I watched like international soccer, but I don't really watch too much club soccer. And then football, yeah. I didn't grow up playing it, but I watch a lot of it, bro. And basketball is like the main thing I watch, but, but we're kind of opposites there on the football. Yeah. What position were you, bro? I was a linebacker and a D end. Nice. Yeah. That's what's up. Bro. I could, I could see you being D end, bro. Did, hey, didn't we hoop when we went to like, where were we in Minnesota or somewhere? Minnesota, yeah. Yeah, we were hooping. <laughs> that's, right. Hoop. that's right. We were hooping in Minnesota. I was like, where was it? Because we've been to Minnesota and then y'all came down here to Texas. Like, was, yeah, it was now. hot. It was hot when it was there. Dude, you ain't ever experienced heat like that, right? That's like a dry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, yeah, that was like that's like the worst possible time to like bring people to Texas. August, beginning of August, like the worst heat possible, bro. But Hey, I promise you all of Texas does not look like that, bro. Like they, <laughs> That's what I've heard. Like, okay, so for the people listening, it's like you bring people from the West Coast, the Northeast, everywhere else in the country that kind of has like this stereotype of, of, you know, Texas where it's like nothing but like cowboys and everyone rides everyone on their, on their horses. And you know what I mean? Like it's the middle of nowhere. And, you know, they're bringing people like to like – 40 minutes outside of Dallas where it's like Deloitte University and it is kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like there ain't nothing going uh, on. It's literally livestock at where we were at. And it's mm. like, everyone came in like, yo, this is what I thought Texas would be. I'm like, nah, <laughs> bro, just 30 minutes over there. It's a whole, you know, DFW, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah that was, that was a good time, bro. Um, but now to, to get back into it, bro. So, when you said like you really dived into orgs that helped you get to where you are now, like, so which orgs were there? I know you talked about, you know, the National Association of Black Accountants, NABA, um, was, you know, student government. Um, me and you met through MLT, so Management yeah. Leadership for Tomorrow. So like, how did these orgs and being involved really help you get to where you are? Cause I feel like a lot of people sometimes they make the mistake of like, oh, I should just focus on school and my GPA as opposed to getting involved or oh, like, this and that you know what I mean so how, how crucial was that for you bro yeah I, I honestly say I'd say the organizations are probably like the most important part of, of this whole journey um due to the fact that and I think a lot of students might be able to take away from this depending on what school you go to you might not always have you know that company you're looking for recruiting at your campus however they're a hundred percent partnered with these different organizations so like we mentioned whether it be like the modern guild the American needs you um inroads etc and it's so big because these these different partnerships through them, you get to meet mentors who are literally where you want to be. So like we said, we met through MLT. Um, I was in Coach Miguel's cohort, and he was actually such a big help, especially for someone like in finance. Like, because yeah, um, you know, my guy, exactly. Yeah. And you have all these different companies, whether it be like Google, et cetera, coming to these organizations to meet you. And that makes it so much easier especially as a student who might come from a Baruch college, who might not be as known like nationwide as like, oh, that kid from like Columbia or Harvard. It's so clutch to be like a part of those organizations because it kind of gives you an opportunity to really like just meet whoever you want to meet. And they also kind of, the organizations really prepare you as well. I feel like, especially when you get to join them kind of early on freshman year, sophomore yeah. year, you go through so many different events where they literally teach you things you're going to be learning in your career. So it gives you like a step up ahead of the game. So I think honestly, for me, 100% the most important, <laughs> most important part of all of this. Yeah, bro. Nava and MLT need to put you in a little promo, bro. Maybe <laughs> throw me in there. Right there. Dude, no, I, I'm in complete accordance with you, bro. Like for me, the orgs I was in, in, you know, my undergrad career is like, those were crucial for me, dude. Like honestly, mm -hmm. I don't know if more than the classes because I learned a lot in the classes, but in terms of like learning how to get these opportunities and getting my foot in the door to be able to meet these companies, that was, these orgs were everything, bro. Like, and, and especially since I joined it from when I first transferred into UT, it's like, they, they really do like progress you and polish you to really like get those interviews, you know, know how to answer them and, and 
you know, prepare for those roles, what you're going to be doing in yeah. the roles. So I agree, man. Like for me, it was uh, Alpha Association of Latino yeah. Professionals for America. And then MLT, bro. Like MLT was, was huge for me because like for multiple reasons, bro, honestly, like obviously meeting the companies, like that's where I met, you know, the dude who ended up, you know, re introducing me to a recruiter at ESPN. Yeah. But even more so, like just meeting people like you and all the other dudes around oh. the country, all the other dudes and girls around the country that like are balling out. And it motivated me. So I'm like, damn, like these people like, are really about it. Like everyone wow. in there was about it, bro. Like, you know, big time internships, big companies, starting their own businesses, just doing, doing big things and coming from like all different backgrounds, you know, like, tough circumstances and persevering bro it was inspirational to me and i was like damn you know what if i could like keep in touch with these people like that's like you know that rule i don't know if you heard it where they say it's like the the people you hang around with the most and you talk to it's kind of like gonna become who you are so i'm like if i could you know keep in touch with these people that are doing big things you know it'll, it'll motivate me to do the same bro so i appreciate you know people like yourself that like you know, we stayed in touch and like we're both motiv motivating each other to do big things, bro. So that's what it's all about, man. No, definitely. And the same here, my guy, like same exact feeling. Cause I think definitely meeting everybody else or members of our cohort in MLT was so big to me. Cause one, it was the first time for, for me personally. So Baruch is really like super business oriented. Mm -hmm. So if you go there, 90% of the kids are a finance major and accounting major. So it was the first time I was really like interacting with students who were like, oh, like I'm studying like this type of engineering. And I'm just like, wow, like yeah. that's crazy. That's honestly so crazy. Um, and just like you said, like I'm, I'm honestly just so motivated every time like we connect when I see what they're doing because <laughs> everyone is doing something. Like right? no one is no one is sleeping. Everyone is just grinding all the time and it's so good to see. It is, man. It's, it's really good to see. And it's like, damn, bro, like these people really don't stop. And it, another thing I thought was cool about it, bro, is like, so down at my university, it's it's actually a pretty big university, UT. It's got like 30,000 undergrad students, but it's like a lot of people from like the West Coast, some from the East Coast, a lot of people actually from New York, and mostly a lot of people from Texas, you know, like the bigger cities and, and outer lying cities. But it's like, I don't know, everyone was kind of like had assimilated to the culture of Austin. And when I went, like, joined MLT and we'd all meet up in another city, it was like I really got to experience, like, so many different, like, little, like, ways of talking, slang, cultures, like, from, you know, New York, yeah. like, how I'll be talking, and then, like, in California, how they talk. So it was just dope to, like, kind of open my mind, bro, and see, like, what other people are doing and how other people operate. And I feel like on the Northeast, bro, y'all are, like, y'all always are moving, bro. Just like how you said New York City doesn't ever sleep. Like, I feel like in, in Texas, there's a, is it like a different type of grind where it's like they go hard, but sometimes you feel like they move in, like they're just chilling, they're moving slow. But in the Northeast, it's like you just keep going and you just you don't turn it off, bro. So it's mad respect to y'all on the grind, man. What is, what is that like, bro? Like, so like the difference between like when you were growing up in Haiti to being in New York City, man, like what, what's that culture really like for like people who have never been or never lived there? Bro, that New York culture is real. <laughs> I really don't know. Like, I don't know if there's a word that really describes it. Like you said, though, like the hustle is is honestly, like everyone's always moving. Everyone's always grinding. Um, Like on my campus, for example, like I think they say like about 95% of our students work like part-time or full-time. So literally you have kids coming in in suits, like to class, because the moment the class is over, they have to like cast a train to go to work somewhere. Yeah. And then you have so many different kids who are also working to like support their families, et cetera. So like everyone is always moving. Like it's almost like there is no time to rest. But at the same time, like we 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 work hard, but we have fun too. Cause I, I think the culture in New York too is is also something like you don't get anywhere else. Like when you head over down to like the like Brooklyn compared to like Soho and Manhattan, like just the fits you're seeing, the vibes are so different. Um, it's such a good feeling. And I think for me personally, coming from Haiti, I, my mind was blown, bro. <laughs> my mind was blown. Yeah. Cause I'm coming from, you know, like Haiti, obviously, where first off, like there aren't really that many major skyscrapers, things like that. Coming to New York and I'm just like, holy shit. Like li literally, Anywhere, so I remember like, <laughs> that was like my first um, kind of reaction. It was just, it was honestly just so crazy. Um, and I do feel like this is, it's a very unique city. Like I do think that no matter where I end up going in life, like New York is always gonna be home. Cause like you said, it kind of like how um, 
like MLT keeps you motivated. I think just being and living in the city always keeps you motivated as well. Like everybody you meet similarly has something going on for them. That's so like it's it's a nice building. That's interesting. I like that. That it's similar to to you know MLT and like everyone you meet is is working on something. I li- I like that vibe. I like that feeling, bro. It's it's good to you know keep constantly motivated, bro. That's what's up. So how old were you when you moved from Haiti to, to NYC? So I moved over, I think I was about seven or eight years old. Seven or eight, so okay. relatively young. Yeah, but yeah. But old enough to kind of like recognize like, yo, like. The differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I feel like there's always a difference between people who move when they're like between, you know, six and 10 years old and the people who move when they're like a toddler, you know what I mean? Because they can't mm-hmm. really uh, decipher those differences between cultures and like the socioeconomics of it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what's up, bro. So um, to dive into it more, bro, back to the Goldman Sachs stuff. So what'd you do for those two summers, man? You kind of dived in already how you got it, but like what functions were you working in and what kind of day-to-day tasks were you doing? Yeah, got you. So both both years, I came back to the same team. However, I was covering like different products, essentially. Mm-hmm. So I was the credit origination analyst, which sat on there that are controlling the branch. So essentially with that credit origination team, um, when you think of a bank, obviously how they make money is through loans, um, things like that. So essentially with that team, whatever was originated, so we would have the making team, for example, say like, I don't know, American Airlines needed to like raise like $400 million, whatever it might be. They would kind of work through the deals with that. And then through my team, we'd be like, okay, like here's the risk associated with it, um, et cetera. How are we going to keep it? Because all of that money actually gets allocated through different portfolios. So with my book for the first summer, um, it was investment grade stuff. So like investment grade being like, you know, A, a graded loans, okay. um, whereas you might have like the more risky stuff at like a B level. So okay. essentially with that, they'd be like, I may or like pretty much day over day, you have to keep, keep in mind how much risk we have allocated to this portfolio and how much money we have to allocate through like for losses. So for example, like for this summer with COVID happening, it was a bit more crazy because all of these banks are all of these different companies are going, you know, um, taking massive hits. So our allowance for they call it a triple L or basically provisions for people who might not be too like finance focused. It's basically yeah. the premise is basically if I say I borrow you like a hundred dollars, um, obviously I'm expecting that money back, but just in case, um, I'm gonna take twenty-five dollars and put it aside. So if you don't in the future you don't give me all of my money, it's kind of I don't take as big of a hit. For sure. So essentially, um, that's kind of what they had me doing. I was working super closely with the credit team to allocate different provisions for pretty much every um, every loan in that book. And that was all investment grade stuff. Um, and the other side of that too, like I mentioned, it was two different sides. We also, they were launching what was called Marcus, which I was super big into because I, like I mentioned, I'm all about that financial literacy. And for people who don't know, Marcus is essentially their online bank platform. So it comes with a saving platform where it's a high yield interest. So where like your normal bank might be giving you 0.03 interest, whatever it might be. Um, at the peak of Marcus, they might've been giving you like 1.6% interest, 2.25% interest. And it's also the partnership with Apple Card. So on a day to day, we were kind of working with um, Apple as well to kind of build out how the different financials of the Apple Card would work out. So my first summer, it was cool because that public that product wasn't public yet. So I couldn't even talk about it to anyone. And I was just out here like working on it and how it worked. And then the second year I came back and it was a, a public product. So everybody already had access to the card. So it was crazy to see how much had changed essentially. So those are the two sides of the coin. So we had like the market side as well as the more like credit focus and business side um, where we had like the different loans being, being raised and the different credit and such. That's what's up, bro. That's crazy that like you knew the Apple Card was coming and this and that, and you just can't talk about it. You know what I mean? Bro, it's it's crazy how in the banks how like secretive they are. Cause literally, like even on my own team, there were some people I couldn't mention it to, and I was like, ah, like yeah, that's wild. That's crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, everything has like a, a internal code name essentially. So instead of being the Apple Card, it would be blank name. Yeah, so that would be the only way to refer to it. Shit. So. So why is that, bro? Like, what what are the different functions or the different teams that you're not allowed to, like, say certain things to? Is it because they're on the other end of, like, what's going on? Or, or, or what do you mean? 
Yeah, it's, it's really a mix of things. So, um, so on a couple of different levels. So for one, for example, like my traders, for example, some yeah. of the loans I couldn't talk to them about because they were trading it on an active basis. Yeah. So throughout the day, if I was like, oh, um, cause they trade in the secondary market. So you trade loans the same way you can trade the stocks essentially. So they were trading in the secondary market. And if I came to them and I was like, oh, like Delta is looking like this today, they could basically use that to their advantage. Yeah. To make massive that. profits would be wrong. And then on my team, um, certain people are covering different things. So just to keep like that, the integrity of the product, it was best to just keep the people working directly on it um, to keep them updated with what was, go what was going on. So if I was working on the Apple card, for example, um, and somebody else was working on like, just the straight um, loans, like you don't need to overlap the two. So like they don't have any of that knowledge and bring it somewhere else too. Cause again, it was a super, the Apple card was a really big product for them. Um, yeah. with that partnership with Apple. So everything was really like, they were really trying to keep it like super like closely knit and internally. Yeah. That is wild, bro. But that makes me feel better though. And, and whoever listens to this, I'm sure they'll feel better too, because it's like the fact that, you know, y'all, y'all still uphold that integrity, you know, to not give away that insider info. And there's very strict regulations in terms of like who you can tell what that makes the mm -hmm. general public feel better. And, you know, like more trusting, of banks you know what i mean so that's what's up and that's wild bro that's so, so wild that you as an intern got to work on the apple card bro like that's uh, yeah that ass, man that you had like an active role in something that ended up being a huge deal you know honestly and, and i think that's something else like to anybody listening who might be considering like an, in an internship either at goldman or like a similar company yeah. i can honestly say like for your internship you're actually doing like real work yeah uh, I know some of my other friends, like they might've been at different places and they were like, yo, like, I feel like I'm not really like being utilized. Mm -hmm. um, I know like the work I was doing was literally like what my analyst was doing before I came. Yeah. And then when I came in, um, she essentially showed me like, okay, um, here's how to analyze what I was working with. Here's how to do it. So then she could basically help out our VP throughout the summer while I covered her tasks. For That's what's up, bro. Yeah, it feels good knowing that, like, you're actually making a difference, right? Like, the work you're doing isn't, like, just, yeah. you know, busy work. So, like, for me, like, I worked on a couple things at ESPN where I ended up seeing it, like, on TV, you know, like, some, I didn't make the actual graphics, but, like, mm -hmm. I was the one who had to, like, communicate between the different, you know, stakeholders in terms of, like, this is what we need to put on the UFC graphic, here are the different slots we need to put it in. Yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So then, when you see it come to life on TV, like that's dope. I had, I had, oh, a yeah, honestly, yeah. Like, How has that been, by the way? Like, kind of like working with ESPN, um, your yeah, full dude. experience. That. It was dope, bro. It was dope. So I would have been up there with you in the Big Apple, bro. You know, if COVID <laughs> right? came down, yeah, I was gonna be in the New York City office. I was gonna be like up on the north side. I was gonna be on like 60th Street. Mm -hmm. Um, so ESPN has like two offices there. They have the Seaport one, like down south. That's yeah. where like Stephen A. Smith and yeah. Kellyman and all the other big time shows are there. They're recording. Um, I have a buddy that like works in production there, or he used to on the Katie Nolan show, and he said that was pretty dope, bro. That was, that was a dope scene. Like you just, it's a small office, and like you just be walking to get coffee, you see Stephen A. And like <laughs> you know, him really not to like say nothing or bother him, you know what I mean? Because he's like in the zone, you know what I mean? But yeah, so I would have been in the other office, the business office where they have like sales, uh, their business development, finance, marketing, et cetera. So I was going to be with live sports marketing there, but I ended up, um, so I was, I was blessed to still get the opportunity to do it, bro. Cause I think there's going to yeah. be about 60 of us in that office and the Bristol one, but it ended up only being about 20 of us. So we're still okay. really blessed to still get the opportunity so I interned with live sports. So there's like within live sports, there's uh, about eight different teams, but one of them is the NFL and MMA team. And when I mm -hmm. say MMA is really UFC, right? Okay. UFC is like the, the big dog and they're booming. Yeah. Bro. They're booming. The numbers they were doing on ESPN plus and all that stuff was, was nice. And part of it was, might've been like the COVID effect. You know what I mean? Like people wanted stuff to watch and fight Island mm -hmm. was like one of the only things at the time. So they kind of got a jump on everyone. But yeah, dude, so I, I interned on that team and they were all like really smart, you know, really driven people. And then there was a couple other teams I got to interact with like programming, business development, kind of seeing how like the finances behind not only ESPN, but like the overall Disney portfolio work, how you have to like balance out those assets and, and like see what else is coming on the horizon. And you know how like 
cable revenues coming down because everyone's pulling the plug and going to streaming. Like it's it's an interesting space to be in, honestly, right now. But it was dope, bro. And some I, I met a lot of people, worked on some cool projects, and uh, yeah, I realized like that's what I want to work in, bro. Like the business side of sports, man. So we'll see where it goes, bro. We'll that's see great. where we're, we're working you on stuff. Is the plan to go um, full time with them as well in New York, or maybe, bro? Maybe um, here I'm probably cut this part out of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just dive in like f- fully raw right now. But like, they're they're cool, bro. They're cool, but like, they're old. They're real like old school. I like, see. it seems like an echo chamber in there at, okay. at sometimes because it's like all the execs have been there like twenty plus years. They're like all older white male or females we're still stuck on like we need to be very safe we're a disney yeah. company we need to be very conservative you know all of our viewership is on cable we can't um you know piss them off this and that but it's like if you keep trying to hold on to what's here you're gonna miss what's coming and what's exactly. coming is like this whole new digital era where it's like barstool the ringer bleacher yeah. report they're balling out on digital That's and if so you can't, crazy. Yeah. right like like for you like what do you what do you really interact with bro like on social media or like well, I, the go-tos, Sports Center, House of Highlights, House, House of Highlights. Report, like you mentioned, yeah. Bar School. Yeah, so they're, <laughs> they're doing a good job with Sports Center. And they, they got the dude who started House of Highlights. Uh, they got Omar. They got Omar, it. Yeah. They run their stuff now. So that was huge, right? But it was kind of like they needed to do that. Like mm-hmm. they, they needed to because they were going to get left behind. So I feel like they need to go more more from like – making moves that out of necessity to like making more risky moves for the future. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I feel like they're like, right now they're like that older white dude in the room who says like corny jokes and like, is always behind the beat. You know what I mean? And they need to yeah. get with it because if not, like, cause back in the day, it's like when we were growing up, you had to eventually interact with, with ESPN to watch sports. Like mm-hmm. eventually a game was going to be on ESPN or sports center, but now like kids growing up, bro, like if you're like, you know, in middle school and you got a phone, like, you don't have to interact with ESPN. At all. Yeah. You, could, you could, NBA Twitter's got you. You're going to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Bleacher Report's got you and quicker and more funnier and better. Barstool, like, anything else has got you. You know, I so they, they're going to lose that whole generation of fans if they don't get it right. Mm-hmm. And my thing is, like, I don't know if I fit that vibe, bro. I don't know if I fit yeah. that playing it safe, um, kind of just, like, staying in my lane vibe. I kind of like some of these other players in the game right now. Like, uh, oh hey, if you got to take a call, bro, you good? You good? Oh, no, okay. What's up? Nah, it's, it's valid. My mom oh, got okay. it. Cool, cool, me, cool. But I'll just... Um, um, yeah, It was bro. actually Shamar from MLT. <laughs> What's up? It was actually Shamar from MLT, too. Oh, bro? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you stay tight with your, your MLT game, huh? Um, yeah, dude, I don't know. There's a couple others, like in the game that I'd like to work at, honestly. Okay. Or maybe even, like, within brands, you know what I mean? Like, uh, being, like, a liaison between an athlete and Nike. You know yeah. what I mean? Got you. Like, at, at the player level or at the league level, team level. There's so many different angles you can hit it at, bro. Mm-hmm. Maybe, like, representation of the players, you know, the team, league, et cetera. You know, there's, there's so many angles. So, I don't know yet. But eventually, bro, I actually want to go and, and, like, have my own show. So, like, yes, that's sir. how I'm trying to do this. You know what I mean? So, so that's like the long-term goal, bro. But, but we'll see. We'll see. You know? I, nah, I, I love that. Yeah, yeah. But no, like, that's, that's like, like my raw view of like what ESPN was. Like I said, amazing people, awesome people, learned a lot. But like also there's like some other stuff I didn't like. So that's kind of like the raw side of it that I'm going <laughs> to have to clip out, bro, before one of them recruiters tunes into the pod. <laughs> oh, damn. He don't want to work here. Fuck all that. You know what I mean? So... <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that, that is a big thing with a, a lot of, like, corporate players, though. Like, that, like, once they get big enough, obviously, you kind of get comfortable yeah. with ha- what has been. Um, and then when you it, – it's a little too late once you realize, okay, the world is fully changing. Like, it's time to, to move a different way. Because even, like, I'd say with GS, like, I'd say that was, to an extent, the, the, exper- the experience. Um, then the CEO currently, like, David Solomon, he's been trying to lead them away from that, okay. which is why – like for the longest amount of time, Goldman Sachs did not deal with regular people, like at all. But I think they realized, okay, with the way the world is changing, like the world is going digital. If I need to trade something, I don't need to call my my um, financial advisor at Goldman. I just go on my Robinhood app, my Weeble, et cetera, yeah. which is why they were kind of forced to like establish that markets platform for like regular people to kind of like no deal with them and know the name. So I feel like it's a similar theme between different companies. 
Yeah, yeah, that's what's up, bro, that they're going more directly to the people like in this new digital age, man. I feel like that's more like uh, the democratization of financial literacy, you know what I mean? Like there's not as many barriers anymore between like people being able to learn what they need to do with their money. And that's mm-hmm. that's what I'm all about, bro. I'm hyped to see it, man. What, what do you think we need to do, man, in, in terms of that? Like, you know, pushing more financial literacy because you and me are both you know, minority men you know, working in the business space. What do we need to do, bro, like, to, to really push for that more within our races, man, and, like, make sure people, you know, are taken care of and, and you know, ca- can do better in terms of their finances, man? Yeah, I think, and excuse me if, like, my heater's making a lot of noise right now. It's starting to kind of, like, I, I can't even, I can't even hear it, bro. Okay. <laughs> you good? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, nah, you um, good, bro. <laughs> I, I'd say, honestly, like you, like you said, it all comes down to knowledge, and I think, which is what I... I'm liking what I'm seeing so far and that it's all becoming so public. Like you go on somebody's TikTok and they're explaining, oh, here's what to do when you buy a house. Don't fall for this trap, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think within our own kind of communities, it's important that like once we, you know, understand it a bit better and we're at positions where we can have effect, that we're passing that on to the entire community, whether that be the youth. Like one of my big goals is to open up a school like myself um, back in Haiti as well, but where I can kind of like teach those, those basic understandings. Um, Because that's really all where it comes from. It's all like the knowledge is not new, but like you mentioned, the access to it has always been limited. And I think as the years progress, um, the access is becoming more and more available due to, you know, the Internet, etc. So I think it's ensuring that, like, you know, different people are aware of here's what to do. Like, I know, like, even with like my investments, a lot of my friends, I was like, whoa, like you're 20. You don't have like an investment account. Like you don't need a lot of money to start this up. So like, even if it's like taking that on to us personally, where I can be like, hey, like open it up, I'll teach you like, you know, here's how to work it. You can have like your recurring investments. So so that over time, we all as a whole can kind of like build our wealth and pass that on to like for future generations and make things better. But I do think it's ultimately all just education and making sure we're we're all playing that role where whatever we know, we're not just keeping that to ourselves. No doubt. Yeah. No, bro, that's huge. Like you said, just giving back and not keeping it to yourself, bro. Mad respect that that you want to open up a school, man. Like that's something I think um, needs to happen, bro, in terms of like education reform. My my thought is like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. It's like, why does someone have to major in accounting or finance or something business related to really understand financial literacy? Like there's no reason why you can't learn a lot of these basic fundamental concepts like at the high school level, you know what I mean? And now yeah. like, just like a little class on like, you know, personal finances or taxes or how accounting works, like something like that, just one little class could make a huge difference in a huge portion of the population's, you know, spending habits and, and financial literacy. So like my thought is like, why aren't we doing that? You know, so if no. you could start a school, and implement that like at an early age, like that's, that'd be like crazy monumental to, I feel like an entire nation's or economy's, you know, well-being, don't you think? No, a hundred percent. And I feel the exact same way. Cause I, I think looking back, obviously a lot of the core classes we take, whether it be in elementary, middle school or high school, they're all important, but what's lacking a lot of the times is those adult, adult skills and the adult knowledge you're actually going to need. Um, I know, like, I was fortunate enough that in high school, I think my junior year, I got to take one of those classes where um, we had a professor and she basically walked us through, like, okay, guys, like, mortgages, like, financing, things like that. But that was, like, in a class where only, like, five or six students were in it. I think things like that do need to be incorporated into, like, just the general kind of um, education system, like you mentioned. I fully support that. And I think the earlier you get people started, like, the more they know. Like, I have an 11-year-old sister who talks about stocks. And like I love seeing that. Like, wow, bro, how'd, how'd you get her on that? She get that from you or what? Like, how'd bro, you... like I'm just I'm a little I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> so like I, I honestly be telling her like I'll be like, hey July, do you know what this means? Like, mm-hmm. um, do you know what it means to own a share? Like just little things like that, and she just picks it up, and it's so nice to see because you realize none of this stuff is difficult to learn. It, it's just like it's just you know it or you don't. If you have someone willing and able to like put you onto it you pick it up pretty rapidly like there's there's no reasons why it should be kind of limited like you mentioned behind like a major or you need to go to a university to understand how money operates i think just globally it's important to kind of just like teach the youth as they're getting older no doubt bro 
That's wild. Your sister's 11. She's already talking about it, bro. What does she tell you she wants to be when she grows up? Like investment banker? Yeah, hell no. <laughs> We're keeping her away from that lifestyle. Yeah, um, it's honestly, a wild lifestyle, bro. Yeah. Honestly, like right now, she's been saying, it changes every couple months. I think right now she's saying she wants to be an actress, which I'm super okay. supportive of. Because I, I think my thing is, because I'm big with my family, bro. Like the reason I'm doing a lot of the stuff I'm doing too is so I can make sure like they're good. They're good. I, think, um, I always grew up seeing my mom working two, three jobs. And like, I never wanted, you know, like, and I feel like by that, I was kind of limited to what I wanted to do as well. So I always wanted to make sure that like, for example, my sister, like whatever she wants to do, like I'm able to really like just provide the resources for her to accomplish that. And I don't want her to limit her to like, oh, go work that finance job, go work that medical mm -hmm. job. It's just whatever your passion is and what you like truly love, like that's what I want you to do. And that, that's why I want to make sure like we have that financial freedom as I get older, that she's able to like pursue and achieve that too. Yeah, dude, no, I think that's huge, man. Like having the financial freedom from somewhere to be able to like pursue your passions, right? And that's so dope that you're working in something you're passionate about. Like you're passionate about financial literacy. You're passionate about stocks. Like you live and breathe this stuff. So it's like, you're doing something you love, like maybe not every single, you know, monotonous task of the job or detail of the job is something you love, but overall, like broad spectrum, like you, you love finance, you know, it's tied into your life's goal. So that's what's up. Bro. I feel like a lot more people need to dig into like, what do I really like? What do I really want to do? Because it, it really pains me. I, to I totally get it because I'm like you, right? Like I, my family hasn't always like had it easy, you know what I mean? And like seeing your mom struggle or, or your parents, you know, your family at times, it's like you want to do something that's going to first make sure you have financial stability. But at the same time, I always hate when it's like someone who could have gone into something else and been really good at it and they could have been happier. They go into something they don't like. Yeah. They hate and they like, you know, just for a dollar. And it's like they, they hate their life, bro. And it's like mm -hmm. that makes me sad. You know what I mean? So I yeah like I don't know the answer bro. I don't know the answer it's just like there has to be a balance right between like what you want to do for yourself and like what like extrinsic and intrinsic motivators like what do I do for status and money versus what I do that actually makes me happy that I'm good at it that I feel like greater like the joy is in doing it you know what I mean so yeah, bro. I, f I feel like more people are, are moving in that direction. So we'll, we'll see where society goes, bro. But I'm curious, man. So you're, you're big in the stocks, bro. So what do you think about like the volatility in the markets this year, bro? Because it's been wild. It's been wild. Like when everyone thought things were going to keep going south, it just went on a rampage. It ain't gone down since. So like Bitcoin, like all this stuff, bro. Like, what's your thoughts? Honestly, it's, it's, it's been interesting. I think volatility to me is good to start yeah. off with. Because I think <laughs> honestly when in March – February when everything was like just taking a dip. Oh, I yeah. think that's when I was making the most. Oh, no, same, bro. Same. My problem was though, when you know that V-shaped recovery came back on, I was like, nah, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna keep going down. And that's oh, when I got burned yeah. a little bit. That's when I got burned a little bit. But when yeah. we we're going down, I was banking, bro. Nah, same. I I honestly I think it's so interesting when I look at the market. Cause like you said, it does keep going up. And like to me personally, I feel like it's so overvalued. But like at the same time, you can't afford to miss out on opportunity because you're waiting for it to like go down. Like you kind of have to like just hedge it effectively um, to the point that if it does keep going up, you're good. And if it does kind of like pull back, you're, you're also good. But I think this year, this year was fun to me. I'm not going to lie. It's been a fun year, right? Think, especially for like young investors who you got to see so much stuff this year that people only get to see like in lifetimes, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Honestly, like we, we, like you mentioned, we went through a whole V-shaped recovery. Um, you had stocks freezing up. <laughs> dude, <laughs> like market dude, is freezing. dude uh, which what, Co uh, was it Kodak? Bro, when Trump oh, was that? That? <laughs> oh my God, bro. Did you get in on that? <laughs> I stayed away from Kodak. Dude, I stayed away from Kodak. Dude, so the day when it was like everyone already knew, but Trump hadn't done that little announcement at 6 p.m. that he was doing every day, it was like... Yeah. Shit, it was probably like six dollars a share. I was like, ah, I'll put a little money into it, see what happens. <laughs> bro, the next morning I wake up like I don't know, eight o'clock, and I'm looking at like the Twitter sphere, you know, like uh Fin Twit Twitter. Yeah. And they're like, ooh, Kodak going past 20. I'm like, nah. 
Dude, the amount of times they put a halt on that thing, because I was trying to sell. I was trying to sell, bro. Like, once they got over 30, I'm like, this, like, is, okay. this is crazy, bro. And I ended up being able to get out at 50. But, like, okay. dude, stuff like that kept happening throughout the year. And it just – the volatility was wild, bro. Like you said, it's a black swan event, bro. People yeah. can see this maybe once in their lifetime. And, like, it's been wild, bro. Do you think the way people are investing and spending the money has changed forever, though? Because we talked about, like, kind of, like, the democratization of, of, you know, investing, how it's changed in this new digital era and how people are pushing for more financial literacy and kind of breaking those barriers between class so more people yeah. can know what to do with their money. You think investing's changed forever? I think 100%. Um, whether it's for the good or the bad, I'm still not too sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, right? I think it, it comes with both pros and cons. Obviously, a pro is cool. Anybody, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you can invest now which is always great. You can pass, pass, passively grow your net worth um, if you invest it properly. Sure. What's a little scary though, is that now due to how it is, it also takes so much less knowledge to hop into, th hop into things. Yeah. I remember when Nicola, Nicola um, you know, they did the merger, everybody hopped on. And I remember I was, I was like, guys, Ooh. I don't know how I feel about this. I think you should kind of like just hold back for now and see how it goes. That's exactly. And everybody was just piling in. And over time, like we see, we come to find out, okay, zero revenue, zero profits, all of this shady stuff occurring with the company. And the stock kind of takes a dip. And everybody's like, oh, no, like, I thought it was to the moon. And I'm like, it doesn't always operate that way. <laughs> so, like, Dude, not only zero profits, zero orders, bro, like zero trucks manufactured, bro. Nothing going on. Like, I, I couldn't understand it. Like, one of my buddies, he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. Really smart dude. He's like one of the top engineering schools. He goes to A&M and he's like, bro, Nicola, they got this hydrogen stuff, these hydrogen batteries going on. Like, bro, they, bro, trust me, in 10 years, you're going to be glad I told you to buy Nicola. I'm like, bro, I understand that, but like, I don't think they really got it going on like that. <laughs> so that, that was a perfect example, bro, of like something crazy. What do you think of this, bro? Because I think the dangerous side comes in where it's like, like you said, it's so easy to jump in that people are jumping in and getting burned. Yeah. Like they're being lied to and misled. What do you think of like all these people? Like maybe it's happened to you. It happened to me. Like I got stuck on like uh, investment TikTok for a minute okay. there. And investment TikTok, I noticed it's just like a bunch of dudes trying to say like, oh, this is how I went from, you know, working a job making 35K a year to being a millionaire by 30. Like yeah. maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. I don't know. They're probably lying. But they'd be like, oh, real estate this, invest in this, forex this. And I'm like, dude, that's probably not real. You're probably trying to monetize, you know, your your brand at this point and trying to like create an image to to market it and sell people like these mentorship things or like, you know what I mean? Kind of like these pyramid yeah. scheme type things. Like do you think that's actually like as big as a danger as I'm thinking it is? Or like, what do you think of all that? The whole like Forex and like all, all the other stuff that's going on where people are trying to take advantage. I definitely think it is. And I, I think, again, it's, it's one of those things that has different sides because some of the points they make, they are, they are real. Obviously real yeah. estate is a great way to, no, you know, build no. your network. Forex is an actual tradable thing where like, no. if you know how to do it, you can profit off of it. However, a lot of the things I'm seeing is people recruiting other people like, oh, pay this and I got you. For those kind of things, I tend to kind of like take a step back because a lot of that information, especially nowadays, you can attain it for free. So I feel like if anyone is telling you, oh, here's how I became a millionaire and like did all of this stuff, pay like two, three hundred dollars for my course. Find that information somewhere on Google, somewhere on YouTube, because I promise you it's there. Because like, I feel like that's the way to go. Um, I do find some of those people shady and I do believe some of them are, do try to be helpful as well. No doubt. Um, what I do tend to find though, I think I connect with a lot of my, my, um, friends who are like super active. I tend to find the ones that are actually like super good traders, like making like bank off of it. They tend to just keep it low key and not like post all oh, and flex, um, all their, like their earnings like that. Cause they do realize there's so much risk that comes into it. You can't, you can't a hundred percent guarantee someone that, okay, everything I tell you is going to take off and hit. Like, especially for people who, who, like, try to teach other people, like, options trading. Like, there's so much risk that comes into it. Like, you could really, like, get burned very rapidly. 
So I think if anyone's trying to give someone like a guarantee, like, yo, give me your money and I'll teach you all of this. And like, you're hundred percent good. That's a little, that's a caution sign for me. Yeah, so, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. You hit it right on the nail, bro. Like, I feel like definitely like when people say Forex isn't real, this and that, no, it is real. Right. Uh, definitely. You can trade in the foreign exchange markets and, and make money. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a risky proposition. You got to know what you're doing, but you can learn how to do it. Right. There's a lot of resources okay. now online where you can learn. It's like, you don't have to pay someone you know, a monthly fee or a yearly fee to be a part of this group and go to these meetings to learn how to do it. Because at that point, it's starting to become a pyramid scheme. And those people at the top are monetizing, making money off of your membership fees as opposed to the actual trading. Mm -hmm. But like, that's when I grow like weary of the situation. But that's interesting that you say like most of the people, you know, that are really good traders are kind of more low key about it. But I feel like that's a more realistic approach. It's like, you know the dangers between like emotional trading, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the dangers it has on your psychology, like getting too hyped up over something going to the moon or something about a tank, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay. I respect those people that are more realistic about it and they know the risks involved, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it's dangerous, bro. I mean, a lot of the people mean well, a lot don't. So yeah, dude, we'll, we'll see, bro. It's, it's crazy <laughs> how things are evolving, bro. It that's, is that's the thing, yeah. It it's definitely is crazy, crazy bro. That's why, if anything, you got to kind of like do your own research first. Yeah. Before you just hop into anything. And I feel like that's, that's what, that's, that's a, that's just like a life tip in general. Like always kind of like do your due diligence oh. before you just hop into anything. All right, bro. So now you worked a few internships in finance and uh, as a fellow minority, as a young black man, how is it working in that competitive space of corporate America, man? Because it's not only like corporate America, it's a competitive space, you know? specifically at the Goldman Sachs, one of the most respected investment banks and financial co services companies globally. Have you ever like felt imposter syndrome or out of place? And like, how have you overcome these feelings and persevered to, you know, achieve success the way you have, man? Because you've obviously killed it. Not yet. Um, I think that's, that's a great question. And imposter syndrome is something I'll start with. And I think that's the first thing I felt, right? I remember um, first summer in training, so we had three days of training before you actually like hit your desk. So at training, it's a good opportunity to meet, you know, a lot of the different interns. Um, and obviously you come in and you realize, okay, there's me. <laughs> and then there's like, you're looking around for like other like minorities, et cetera. And you realize, okay, there's really not that many of this. Okay. Secondly, you start speaking to other individuals because obviously like, that's not the biggest thing. Everyone is a unique individual you want to connect and everybody I met, they're like, oh yeah, I go to Brown, like I go to Cornell, I go to Harvard. And I'm like, yo, like <laughs> I go to like a CUNY school, yeah. like my little state school. So I'm like, ooh, we start talking a little more. And I remember they're like, oh yeah, like we're going to the lake house. I'm like, yo, like I didn't have my own bedroom until I was like 18. So like, <laughs> like what do I even talk to these people about? So like, it was like at first, like imposter syndrome, like it was really like almost setting in. Cause like, I really felt like I did not belong ultimately. Cause you know, like you're seeing all these big name schools, you're hearing about people's different past experiences. But at the end of the day, I think what saved me is remembering like, no matter where a person came from, um, where they are, we're still at the same spot right now. So that was always my thing. I was like, okay, cool. Um, at the end of the day, we're still doing the same position. We're still about to get paid the same. And the only thing that's gonna distinguish us is who performs better. And like you mentioned, it is a very competitive competitive space and i feel like as a minority coming in we always do feel like okay we do have to work like 1.5 two times harder than than our peers in order to kind of like stand out so that was always my thing coming in um i'll say hit once i did hit the desk though um i want to say like, i felt supported so at the firm specifically they i know they had a program where essentially they would partner you with um a vp mentor who would touch base with you and you could talk to them about literally anything and they would touch base with your manager as well to make sure kind of like your reviews are accurate. So for example, when, when I came in, I met my VP um, and we, we really hit it off. Like I could talk to her about anything. And I remember I was like, okay, cool. My first week, um, I was like, yeah, like my manager, like we covered some stuff. I asked for additional work, but he didn't really have anything to give me. She was like, okay, she took notes. So then when my, um, kind of refer, um, review session came back and my manager was like, oh, 
I forgot what my manager had said exactly, but my VP stood up for me and she was like, no, that's incorrect. You did not give him enough to do. It's not that like, you know, mm -hmm. I think in that aspect, the firm did a good job. Um, I don't know. <laughs> like, I want to say like, it, it definitely, I'm going to go back real quick because I feel like I might have strayed yeah. away from my original point. Um, no, I think as a minority, it, it is tough, but it's also reminding yourself that like at the end of the day, regardless of what anybody tells you, you belong where you are and you probably, like you work your butt off. Um, ultimately, my experience as like a black individual was very positive. One of my biggest fears coming in was my hair. Cause like, you see my hair right now, I got my twisted. Yeah. And like at the time, like, I didn't have the twist, but I had like the large like fro type. So I was okay. I was like, oh, like I wonder how they're gonna judge me for that. Yeah. But I did not want to be fake to myself. Like I remember some of my friends, my mom was like, yo, cut off your hair, like the day before your internship. And I was like, nah, that's no. not really me. Like, I think what's important is no matter what you're doing, bring your genuine self because it shouldn't matter if people are feel uncomfortable at the end of the day. Because we're gonna come in, we're gonna perform. They should feel uncomfortable because if by them feeling that uncomfort, it's gonna uncomfort. It, it goes away rapidly. So if someone doesn't feel comfortable initially, give them time and they'll feel comfortable with you. And that's how we make paths for like those students coming up behind us. I feel like. So I feel like that was always like kind of my big thing. Um, I'm not sure if I really touched upon it as well as I wanted to, but feel free to like kind of ask additional questions to like flesh yeah. that out. I suppose. Yeah, no doubt, bro. No, that was an awesome job of, of telling your story, bro. Like the imposter syndrome, and and I think a good point you made at the end there, bro, is like why should you make yourself feel uncomfortable? Make yourself feel like you're being someone that you're not, just to make others feel comfortable. You know, like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like all parties involved or, you know, it's, it's good for everyone involved to kind of break out of their comfort zone a little bit, grow a little yeah. bit, you know what I mean? And it's like, you're doing so by staying your true self and going into a new environment and staying true to who you are. And they're doing it by like becoming comfortable with someone they're usually not used to being around or a different culture or hairstyle. You know what I mean? So like respect to you for, for keeping, keeping the flow, you know what I'm saying? Okay. <laughs> Locks, yeah. Like, uh, that brings me like, do you remember Jay? Jay Sultan, he was also an MLT. He, Not I think for sure. He, I'm really uh, bad with the names, honestly. Yeah, so he told me an interesting story at uh, when he was at Procter & Gamble, like how he would keep his earrings in. He'd keep them in his ears, and he was like, I thought about taking them out, but I was like, this is just me. It's who I am. And he was like, you know what? People respected me two times more for staying true to myself, not changing my accent, my lingo. You know, obviously keeping it professional, but like, oh, yeah. you know, not trying to be fake to fit in. Cause he was like, I was with another dude who's also like another minority. He like completely changed the way he talked. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? He went into like that super like customer service voice. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I think people in the end will respect you more for being you and being fake. So mad respect, bro. mad respect. Like, and then like on the imposter syndrome stuff. Um, so I didn't feel that at ESPN because I was in a, a virtual aspect. And I think yeah. because I'd already learned how to deal with those emotions before, but like I started off in a small community college, like in Dallas, right? It was like a low income community college, like a, a lot of minorities, like very low retention rate, very low transfer rate. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I had balled out there, like not to like sound cocky or anything like that. Like I worked really hard cause I wanted to get into UT's business school. Right. Yeah. So when I finally got in, it was like going from a hundred to zero because it's like, you go from being like one of the hardest working, smartest dudes at the community college to being like absolute imposter syndrome when you get to the university. So everyone I encountered was like, Oh, I was a valedictorian in my class. I was a senior yeah. in my class. I was this percent. I was that percent. I was like, bro, I was like 50% at my high school. <laughs> I don't even remember. You know what I mean? So it, it was like, damn, bro. So at first I'm like, shit, like these, these are some smart people. Like I like it, whatever feel a little bit out of place but whatever but then when I got into the classroom it was like people were like super uptight like I'll never forget I had an 8 a.m on a Monday um a statistics class like business statistics and we're like we're learning about you know like T stats E stat all this stuff you know what I mean like you you, you know what I'm talking about yeah. <laughs> a terrible shit you know so like there's this dude who sat in the front of the room. He was like all spiffied up. He had his like golden plated name tag. And he's like everything. He like knew the answer to everything. 
like, damn, this is what it's like, huh? Because this is my first class at the university, bro, 8 a.m. And I started to notice everyone around me is, like, super, like, they don't want to work together. They're, like, super, like, oh, this class is uh, graded on a, on a weighted GPA scale. So it's, like, the class average has to be a 3.0 to a 3.2. So it's, like, you're competing yeah. for a limited number of A's in the class. And could, because at the end, everyone's going to be, like, rounded up and into, like, 3.0, 3.2. So I started to notice, like, damn, everyone here is kind of, like, being an asshole. Like, they don't want to help out. They don't work together. And then, like, I, in group presentations, it's, like, people are asking questions to grill the other group. So they look like they don't know what's happening. Like, one of my buddies told me that in his class, it was, like, a group did a presentation over, I think it was Tesla. This was two years ago. And something huge in the news had just emerged for Tesla within the past 20 minutes that there's no way they could have known or prepared for yeah. it because they were presenting and homeboy just asked them and he's like, okay, well, how's this going to affect their business? This and that just to like grill them, bro. So the professor would think like, Oh, they don't know what they're talking about. You know? So like just little like shady stuff like that, little like snob snobby things were going on when I first transferred. In addition to me, like struggling with the class material because of like the, um, the rigor from community to, to like a top yeah. business school, like, go that uptick and workload like really hit me hard I, I mm. took me a second to adjust and part of it was me like I shouldn't have signed up for as many tough classes because like like I said I was going from like 100 to zero because like I was like oh I could accomplish anything I balled out over yeah. here and, like I can keep the momentum going nah bro should have <laughs> yourself. Should have taken it a little bit easier you had a little bit too much dip on your chip you know what I'm saying so it bodied me hard bro like academics um just like everything I love to do. Like I, I like to like, you know, play sports, work out. I didn't have time for it anymore because I was struggling to, you know, survive in the academic yeah. environment. And then that affects social. So it was like, I just got bodied hard with imposter syndrome. So like I'd learned ways to get through that in terms of just remembering who you are, like little, but just finding things to really ground you and get, get your balance back. Like, who am I? What do I do? Just remembering, like you said, like you belong here. We all yeah. came from different backgrounds and environments, but at the end of the day, you're here. You're here for a reason. You earned it. So just remembering that to get through imposter syndrome, man, like that's that's huge. Just remembering, like, no matter where we came from, like, we all here. We all earned it one way or another, bro. And uh, yeah, respect to you for getting through it, bro. Respect to you. Uh, but there's never been an instance, bro, where like uh, you, like something was said or, or something like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, there has. Okay. Um, I think what surprised me the most, though, was that it didn't come from the professionals. It actually came from the interns. Um, I, I expected like, that, honestly. So I honestly didn't. I thought it would be a bit a bit more different. I think coming into the bank, I always had this perception that, oh, like, people at Goldman Sachs are very snobby, et cetera, which I have to say, like, coming in, it was the exact opposite. Like, okay. the professionals there, right. everybody is literally just like, yo, bro, like, how can I help you? It honestly caught me yeah. off guard. That incident, though, occurred where, um, so obviously a group of interns, it was when we had, our internship was in person. So obviously everyone's trying to get to know each other, et cetera. And obviously like people are drinking, whatever. So things are being said. Um, and I remember like I was connecting with one of the interns and I remember what he was saying. And he was like, oh, but don't lie. You know, it's, it was so much easier for you to get in here than it was for me. And I was like, I was like, what are you talking about? He was like, you know, and I was like, nah, I, I really don't know. He was like, you're black. So like, they're always just gonna like give you the role. And I honestly never felt so insulted before because I felt like, first off, like you don't know what I've been through. Like you're just assuming that like, oh, like this role was handed to me. Like, obviously like you don't know my background. Like you mentioned like the struggles I've gone through both within the university, the, the leadership I've had to display, et cetera. And then he said that and I was just like, it honestly just threw me so off guard. And it was the first time like in that environment that something was just like, said like that and he was like oh yeah don't be offended but you know it's true and i was just like <laughs> like i laughed it off yeah um but it, it honestly like really hurt to like hear wow. somebody say that to me yeah. um for sure i think outside of that though yeah it was always like little little things little thing. um i'd say within the interns um and obviously a lot of them were also coming from you know environments where maybe they hadn't had too much interaction with like someone like me for example no. um so like i i, I kind of tried to understand things from both perspectives but that one really stuck out for me a hundred percent and out, outside of that though like i'd say like just working at the firm myself it was always like literally positive i remember like one day like 
like I said, I actually did my twist and I came into work and my manager was like, oh shit, like, yo, bro, like, it's, it's, that's fire. And I was like, are you sure? Like, I was like, I wasn't going to come in like this. He was like, bro, like, I don't care what you're doing. Like, just, is the work getting done? Yeah. And I was like, obviously. And he was like, all right, so you're good. So like within like the more professionals, the professionals at the firm, it was always good reactions. But I think that interns kind of threw me off to, to, a, to a degree. Yeah, bro, that's what's up that your your manager, like, you know, gave you that confidence to, like, come in oh, yeah. and be yourself. That's what's up, bro. Honestly, I think that, that's something. Oh, my bad. What were you saying? No, no, you're good. I was going to say, that stings, though, like, that a fellow intern would take a shot at you like that. You know what I mean? Because, like, I, like yourself, you know, like, you hear little comments here and there, but, like, one, like, directly like that, that that's yeah. tough. You know what I mean? Like, how do you have the audacity to say something like that? But that shows a lot about your maturity. And the way you think, the fact that you're trying to take a position of like trying to gain perspective and empathize of like, okay, maybe this dude hasn't ever interacted with people in environments, you know, like, like where, I, where I'm at, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the fact that you took the high road says a lot about you, bro. Cause like, that's a fucked up comment. No, nah, bro. I was like, that, 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 I felt that bro. Like that stings like that. People really think that they'll look at you after all the hard work you've done and you know what, how hard it's been on you. You know what I mean? Like some stuff that the outside world will, will probably never know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, they really think that you just got it because you're minority. Like, yeah. come on, bro. And then people think the same thing about scholarships and about all sorts of things too. They're like, oh, you only get it because you're a minority. Like, no, like you got to work hard, bro. If it were that easy, like every – Everybody exactly. would be in this position. You know what I mean? Like, it's obviously still a competitive pool to get into. And there's mm-hmm. hurdles, socioeconomic hurdles that I had to go through that maybe you didn't go through because of my skin color. So I think that maybe it's even the opposite of what he's saying, bro. Yeah. Maybe it's even more respect to you that you got a role given that you're a minority. You know what I mean? So it's, mm-hmm. it's a fucked up comment, bro. Respect to you for, for taking the high road, man. Always, oh. always. <laughs> that was a risk, oh, honestly. Man. I'm, like, so big on... And I really appreciate my mother for raising me this way. Like, I'm so big on this positive energy, bro. I just want to make everyone feel as good as possible. And, like, if you send negative energy towards me, that's you taking your time to put that negative energy out. I'm always, like, stay positive and, like, just stay good. No doubt. No doubt. It says a lot about the person, bro. When they take time out of their day, out of their limited amount of energy to really try and put some bad vibes onto you into Mm -hmm. the world. Like, what does that say about you? Like, are you you know, threatened by, you know, my, my charisma or how good, you know, my confidence, how good I feel about myself. Like, you know, like that just speaks to your own insecurities. So I'm with you a hundred percent there, bro. Like that's how I was raised too. It's like life is short, you know, and uh, you just got to enjoy it, man. You got to, you got to do you and just grind. You know what I mean? So I have respect, bro. Dude, that's what I noticed about you and the other Baruch guys, man. That, that's why I really <laughs> vibe with y'all when like we went to play basketball and everything. Like you guys are like, Seems like y'all are a tight knit group. Like I don't know if it's because it's like, you know, y'all y'all all interact a lot because you said the college is smaller, right? But like, yeah, y'all all were like just laughing, like good chemistry, charisma. Bro, I really vibe with it, bro. So that's yeah. that's why I was like, you know, I may may or be a good dude to bring on the pod. You know what I mean? Appreciate that, my guy. <laughs> but not yet. It's, it's honestly always good vibes because at Baruch too. So Baruch is a more like diverse okay. school, but not necessarily like towards like black individuals, for example. It's the, the vast um, population is Asian students followed by like um, Caucasian students. Mm-hmm. So in that way, I feel like for us in MLT, we kind of got to know each, each other really early on because like in our classes, we would notice, oh, like I'm in my class with, you know, Shamar, for example. So like just throughout the years, both out those connections and it's always positive vibes. Like those guys are honestly like some of the peop- best people I've ever met where they're always just like supporting me and like anything I bring up, and it's honestly just so good to like just know you have people you can like truly rely on to like just uplift you (laughs) no doubt bro no doubt that's huge bro like that's so huge like for me too just having those people that that can uplift you like people you know you feel a sense of relatability to and you know similar goals so that's what's up bro so all right fam this has been fun I appreciate you going into depth. I hope someone out there, you know, gains value from, from your story, you know, the things you've overcame and the things you've done to land roles in competitive spaces like Goldman Sachs, you know what I mean? And, and the goals you have for 
financial literacy and opening up a school in Haiti. Like, mad respect to you, bro. This has been fun. So to end it off, I'm gonna hit them with a little rapid fire, bro. So I'm just asking a few quick questions and you just like, answer in like a couple words, a sentence. You know what I mean? Absolutely. All right, bro. So long Bitcoin or no? You think long term it's it's good investment or what? Uh, you know. oh. <laughs> this is a tough one. I am, but I don't think this is a good entry point. This isn't a good entry point? You think a little bit more correction? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting, bro. Interesting. It's had like a 20% correction this week, no? From like the 40,000? It did, but I think it went back up to like 37 right now or something like that. 36, 37. Dude, what gets me about crypto is like it never stops. You know what I mean? Like it, the stock market, it's like 8.30 to, or well, you know, for me, yeah. central time, it's like 8.30 to, to 3. It's really the only time you got to worry about it. But like, you know, you got after hour stuff going on, but it's nothing like insane. But it's like yeah. crypto don't stop, bro. It's like middle of the night. <laughs> that shit's like ripping like to new highs. I'm like, bro, that sounds, seems stressful, bro, to like, if you're managing like just straight up crypto all the time. Man, yeah, that'd be tough. Days off, definition, but anyways, okay. So, so you say yes, long term, but not yet, not right now. Yeah, long term, if you can get a good entry, I think. Yeah. Okay. What What do you think about like JP Morgan saying like 150k if they can compare? They're dragging it. <laughs> They're dragging. Yeah, it's a I, think, I feel like corporations are building hype to it because they are trying to establish their own coins and yeah. establish platforms to trade those coins. So I feel like by establishing those price targets, you're getting people more actively engaged in it which will ultimately lead to more profits for them yeah yeah that is true bro so it's interesting man definitely not the perfect example of like a human being but like jordan belford i listen to his podcast sometimes and um he's like all right you know like the wolf of wall street dude he's like all right check it out if you are in something and you wanted to go to 30 dollars you don't say this shit's going to a hundred dollars you know what i mean so people can get in and get hyped yeah. up about it. So I think that's a, maybe an example of what we're seeing. Like, obviously, it's going to go up, but 150K, you know. Yeah, by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know about all that. Mm -hmm. But anyways, bro, LeBron or MJ for GOAT or someone else the GOAT in your eyes? <laughs> I'm going to stay out of this and say, like, Wilt Chamberlain. <laughs> Wilt Chamberlain. Hey, that's a good way people take it, bro, to – to not come under fire, you know what I'm saying? Okay. okay. All right. Pineapple on pizza or not? Oh, 100%, bro. Give me my pineapple, pineapple give me some chicken. <laughs> That's honestly my go-to order. Yeah? Okay. Yes, I'm with it. I'm with it. That's that's valid on certain pizza styles, though. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. certain pizzas. It's not for every pizza. You know what I mean? Like, a deep dish versus, like, you know, a more flat pizza. Or like, it, it just depends. It just depends, but... I do, I do fuck with. I do. <laughs> um, who's who's the goat soccer player in your eyes, bro? To me, okay. I don't know if people are gonna agree with this. I still say Ronaldinho. Ronaldinho? Yeah. I grew up. I that? grew up on Ronaldinho in Brazil. So <laughs> to me, like in my eyes, he was just crazy. Yeah, Ronaldinho, bro. Um, the Elastico move. <laughs> crazy, bro. Bro. Um, yeah, Ronaldinho. I wish I watched more of him when he played, man. Mm -hmm. I, w I really wish I did. It was just so he was just so fun to watch. Like I, I like watching his highlights on YouTube still, like the Tiki Taka over in Barca. Like he's just a fun player. For me, I'd say Pele, bro. Like yep. yeah, Pele. like I think I, I want to say like he ended wars, bro. Like when, <laughs> when he play, like for real. Like I think uh, there's like an international game between like Brazil and another country. And they weren't going to play it because, like, their, their countries were warring. And then, like, they're like, nah, we're going to end the war for two days. That's and, actually crazy. Like, Pele playing against our country. And, like, I don't know. That just speaks to me, like, the volumes that uh, – volumes of, like, how sports can impact society, bro. 100%. In terms of, like, just teaching you values of, like, leadership, communication, work ethic, and just, like – at the end of the day, we're all different but got the same goal to win the game. So, yes, yeah, bro. That's what's up. But, hey, man, this has been fun, bro. And uh, – yeah, dude, let, let me know, like, um, you know, keep me updated on, on what you're doing, bro, and how the job search is going, man. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, bro. Are you, are you trying to stay in New York full time or what are you, where are you trying to go? Yeah, so I signed full time in New York. Um, I, ended up, I ended up signing up for a consulting firm. 
and mm -hmm. AT Carney, which is more boutique. But like, I really enjoyed the interactions I had with the people. So I was like, cool. Um, and what I like about it is like, even though I'm in New York, mm -hmm. Monday to Thursday, I should be in a different city or a different country. Gosh. So like a lot of travel opportunity. Hell yeah. So ultimately that, that was the move for me. No doubt, bro. That sounds fun with consulting, bro. The fact that like you have your home office, but you get to travel out to all the companies you're doing business with. You know what I mean? Yeah. That is dope. But were you were you excited to travel to the most? Honestly, we'll see. We'll see. Um, I oh, I spoke to so one of the um the managers I spoke to. He had just finished the rotation in Dubai, and I was like, bro. And he was telling me like <laughs> he was living good. Because keep oh, in mind, like, the firm pays for, like, your housing. They pay for everything. So he was, like, living good. And I was like, okay, like, I might have to make my round there. Damn, bro. That does sound like the life, bro. You're going to be eating good over there. <laughs> she some exotic shit over in Dubai, bro. You have to let me know how the steakhouses over there are, bro. Bro, 100%. You, guys. All that, bro. you know, you know I me. Mean? You see me on IG, bro. I love food, bro. So. I prayed. I prayed. Yeah. But that's what's up, bro. Mad respect to you. Congrats on signing full time, bro. Appreciate Proud you, you and excited to see what you do, man. Excited, yeah. man. So, so in some, like, what, what made you want to make the switch from like working, you know, banking side of things to consulting, man? Yeah, I think it was a couple things. One, obviously, like one of them I had tried already, and, and two, it was the fact that even though I know like what I want to accomplish and the different goals I have, um. Just the fact that consulting, you kind of like get to touch base on different things. Yeah. Like you could be working in this industry one day, and whether it's payments, um, could be working with like, you know, automation um, and more technology stuff. So I did appreciate the fact that it gave me the opportunity to really like touch base with like different industries, meet different people. And I feel like all of that will kind of like help me build out my network to like accomplish my goals further um, long term. No doubt, bro. That's huge, right? That's a huge other aspect of it, right? You're doing business with so many other people, so many other stakeholders. Like, it's, you're building a big network. So. All right, right, bro. Well, yeah, I don't know. God. I don't know. We'll see where I end up full time. You know, the ESPN stuff, that's over there in the Big Apple, bro. So I might be pulling up. We'll see. We'll see. Hey, bro. let me know. Hey. Let me know. Yeah, yeah. We'll see, bro. Um, but hey, this was fun, fam. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. I enjoyed catching up, man. Same here, my guy. I appreciate you for having me. Bro. You know, I'll keep, keep you updated. Keep reaching out. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Hey, good luck with the startup stuff and all the other stuff you're doing, bro. I'll let you know when I edit this and get it uploaded, bro. It should be soon. So, happy, happy. Appreciate yeah, that. I appreciate you doing it, bro. I'll make sure to shout you out and everything. And uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> let you know when it all goes up in the digital sphere. All right, sounds good, my guy. Hope all you right, have a good bro. Take it easy, fam. Later. Tell me such a smart out.